Okay. Okay, with that, let us, let us begin. Um, okay, so again, just a few announcements here will be helpful if people want. Again, these are helpful for life. It'll be helpful this year in the back. If you haven't gotten one yet, there are bookmarks with the timeline of Tanakh. Um, they're on that back table. Um, okay, so... Um, Malachim, the rise and fall of the Jewish dynasty. Uh, this year is sponsored uh, by my uh, by my in-laws, Mimi and Byron Shore, Lazekra Nishmat, um, Naftali Ben Mendel, and Chaya Dabrusa, but Schneier Zalman, my grand grandparents-in-law. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so let's start. So the book of Malachim. So if my count is correct. The book of Milachem is the third longest Sefer in Tanakh chronologically. Um, I got all three of the longest books chronologically in Tanakh. Um, the longest book in Tanakh is Divrei Hayamim, but that's only because it starts with the creation of the world and then goes from there. Then after that is Bereshit. But the third longest, if you have these, uh, if you have the bookmarks, is um, Milachem. Milachem is the dark green. You have them, right? The monarchy, which, as you see on the bottom, is about 400 years, right? Yoshua and Shoftim together are about 400 years, but Malachim is about 400 years. So, 400 years and 30 minutes uh, or less. Malachim, the book of kings. Um, Malachim, according to the Gemara in Baba Batra, Daf Yudalit Amud Bet, is attributed to Yirmiyo. Yirmiyo is one of the prophets of the destruction of the, of the Beit HaMikdash towards the end when he's giving Musar and Tochachai, he's giving rebuke to the Jewish people. So he writes Melachim at the end. Melachim ends with the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash um, as we move towards the rebuilding of the, of the Beit HaMikdash. Um, it starts with and this is what we're going to focus on. It starts sort of weird. And this is where I want to pick up. <clears throat> if I asked you, a book called Milachim, where should it start? Who should begin the book of Milachim? What? So one possibility is Shaul, the first king of the Jewish people. That's a good possibility. It's not correct. He's in Shmuel. What's the next possibility? David. David. Meaning, maybe Melachim is about the Davidic kingdom, in which case it's a star with David. But where's David's story told? Well, and here's the problem. Shmuel, sort of. Melachim begins in a very weird place. Melachim, if you look at your sources at number one, starts with David, but not David, how he becomes king, nor David in his heyday. It starts... King David was now old, advanced in years, and though they covered him with bedcloths, he never felt warm. So his courtier said to him, and this was a... Um, I don't think the solution would fly nowadays. He's cold, he's cold, he's cold. Let a young virgin be sought for her master, the king, to wait upon his majesty and be his attendant, and let her lie in your bosom, and my lord, the king, will be warm. The story begins with this sort of strange beginning. David is elderly, David is dying. And um, he can't, he's freezing, he can't stay warm. So they come up with the, the solution, get him a new wife, whatever, attendant, who will keep him physically warm. And then it goes on to tell you he's, she's extremely beautiful, but they're not intimate. Um, and then the, the, it tells you in Pasuk that So one of David's sons, Adoniel, says, you know what, my father is getting old. Ani Emlo. Now many people mistakenly believe that, that David faced two rebellions in his life. <clears throat> Earlier in Shmuel, he faces a rebellion from his son Avshalom, 
who deposes him as king, mounts a coup, sleeps with his wives, and is eventually killed. And then Adoniahu mounts a rebellion. Um, it's not true. Adoniahu does not rebel against David. Um, and that can be seen by a very simple nuance in the Hebrew. He does not say, Ani melech. He says, Ani and lo, I will be king. Meaning, he's not trying to depose David. He sees his father is dying. So what does he say? I want to be the crown prince. So what does he do? He acts like the crown prince. He gets himself an entourage. At that point, he invites the officers of the king who, want, who support him. Yoav, who's the general, he, he uh, invites the head of the, he invites one of the leaders of the Kohanim. He does not invite Shlomo. He, obviously, as Shlomo is, it is known, to what extent is it not, is not exactly clear, but who will be the king. He does not invite Natan and Navi, who is the prophet who was involved in appointing Shlomo or designating Shlomo. He does not invite Bathsheba. Um, and he makes a party presumably to claim that he will be the crown prince. At that point, the Navi tells you that Natan, the prophet who is responsible for David's monarchy, essentially, the one who had rebuked him in the episode of Bathsheba, comes to Bathsheba and says, Bathsheba, we have a problem on our hands. Adoniahu wants to be king. So here's the plan. Go in to David. Tell him, didn't you tell me that Shlomo, my son, is going to be king? Make him feel guilty. Tell him that Adoniah is becoming king. And then I will burst in and we'll, we'll stage this and I will accuse him the same way. And we will gang up on him and we will push Shlomo into the monarchy. Now, Bathsheba doesn't do this. Um, Bathsheba does go to David, um, but she actually, she's very smart. She's very, very smart. Instead of doing what Natan said, which was yell at David and accuse him of breaking his promise, instead, she, um, she speaks to him and says, um, and this I didn't put for you, but uh, what she says is quite beautiful. Instead of saying, didn't you say, she so comes and says, the eyes of all of Israel look to you to see who will be king. Instead of accusing him, she encourages him and she says, you may be sick, you may think you're dying, but you are king. People care about what you say. Come out and say something and they will listen, which is indeed what happens. And David says, I will solve this problem. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to wait till I die. I'm not going to appoint an heir, I'm going to appoint a king. And he appoints Shlomo as king in his life. By so doing, the rebellion, or not the rebellion, but Adoniahu's attempt at becoming the monarch is negated, and Shlomo becomes king. Perik Bet, and this is source two, tells you that in the second chapter, David actually is dying. Right? We thought he was dying in chapter one, but he actually didn't. He lived for a few more years, but this time he's actually dying. David is dying, so he gives his dying commands to Shlomo, and he says, I'm about to die, but you, you will be strong. You're going to be a man. And you'll keep the Torah, you'll keep the word of God so that you're successful. And then he continues in Pasuk Hey, skip to five, you can look in the English. And you know what Yoav did to me. Yoav, my general, he was too powerful in my lifetime. I couldn't take care of him, but he rebelled against me. <laughs> Earlier, when Avner, the general of Shaul, had wanted to bring over Shaul's side to me, Yoav didn't trust him, he didn't like him because he'd killed his brother, so he killed him. And that caused me all types of political problems. Yoav is a rebel. Take care of him. And Shemi ben Geira, when I was fleeing from Avshalom, he was terrible to me. He cursed me. Kill him. Find a way 
to kill him. And he goes through and he lists the people he has a vendetta with. And he tells Shlomo, take care of them. You're smart. Not yet the smartest person ever, but you will be. And when you are, take care of my enemies. And Perik Bet, that's what happens. Shlomo finds ways of killing them. Perik Gimel opens with Shlomo as king. So now let me ask you, what is Milachim? Milachim is weird. He doesn't start with Shaul, who is the first king. He does start with David, that sort of makes sense, but it doesn't really start with David. It starts with David sick, David's weird story with Avishad, then Perik Bed, David's vendettas, and then Perik Gimel picks up with Shlomo. What exactly is the theme of the book? What is the theme of the book? Why does it start at the near end of David's life. What story is Melachim telling you that that was the logical place to start a book? So, here's an insight from Mori Barabi, or Moshe Lechlensin, that I think is the key to the Sefer. Moshe Lechlensin says, if you look through Tana, there are many death stories. And death stories in Tanakh are very different. I'm going to list four for you. <clears throat> Avraham. When Avraham dies, how many psukim describe Avraham's death? You don't have to guess. I gave it to you in number three. <laughs> Not so much. Avraham's getting old. And Hashem had blessed Avram in all things. So what do you expect the next Pasuk to be? And Avram died. He's getting old, he died. Instead, what do you get? Instead, he appoints his uh, chief servant, Eliezer, to go find a wife for Yitzchak. He tell, tells him, make a vow. And then you get a very long story of... Eliezer going down, finding a wife for Yitzchak. The whole story with Rivka. In the next parak, you get four psokim. This is the second half of number three. This is parak Chafhei, Pasuk Zayim to Yud Aleph, 25, 7 to 11. So look at the English. This was the total span of Abraham's life. 175 years. And Abraham breathed his last, di last, dying at a good, ripe age, old and contented. And he was gathered to his kin, his sons. Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Chiti, facing Mamre, the field that Abraham had bought from the, from, the, from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried, and Sarah, his wife, after the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac settled near Be'er Lachai Roim. That's Avram's death. Question? No? Okay. Um, that's Avram's death. How many psukim are devoted to Avram's death? Four. Right? One, two, five. No, four. Five. Five. Five psukim, right? Five psukim. Not so many. How about Yaakov? How many psukim are devoted to Yaakov's death? A lot. It's called a, it's a whole parsha. It's called this week's parsha. Lucky us. Vayichi. Right? Vayichi. I gave you some of it in 47. No, sorry, in, in, it's chapter 47. I gave it to you number four. It takes up chapters 47, 48, and 49 in Breshi. First, we hear that Jacob lived 17 years in the land of Egypt, so that the span of Jacob's life came to 147, 147 years. And when the time approached for Israel to die, he summoned his son Joseph and said to him, Do me this favor, place your hand under my thigh as a pledge for your steadfast loyalty. Please do not bury me in Egypt. So first, we get speech one to Yosef. Then he gets speech to Yosef. Bring your sons. I need to bless Ephraim and Menashe. I need to make your children part of the Shvatim. Then you get chapter 49. The blessings of each of the children of Yaakov. It's three complete chapters devoted to the death of Yaakov. Let's take a third death. Moshe. How long does the Torah, how much space does the Torah devote to Moshe's death? A book. An entire book. Dvarim is his dying speech. If you want just his dying moments, it's a whole parsha. It's Bezod HaBracha. 
And again, similar to Yaakov's death, he blesses each tribe. He gives them his final speech. And then you get that beautiful description at the end. Velo kam navi ke Moshe. There was no one as great as Moshe who spoke to God, tell, tell, spoke to God mouth to mouth. <laughs> so Moshe Lichtenstein asked the following question. Why does Avram get four psukim? He gets a hundred something psukim devoted to the story of him finding a wife for Yitzhak when he thinks he's going to die. But his death gets four psukim, five psukim. Yaakov gets three chapters. Moshe gets a book. Why? So he says it's very simple. Are you the beginning of an era, or are you the end? Avram was the beginning of an era, the era of the Avot. And therefore, what's more important, his death or his ensuring continuity? Ensuring continuity. His death gets five psukim. The story of him finding a wife for Yitzchak to make sure that there will be a second generation gets over a hundred. Yaakov is the end of an era. He's the end of the Jewish family, the beginning of the Jewish people. He gets three chapters. Moshe, beginning or end of an era? An end. We know. The end of the Torah. The low Last psukim, lo kam navi od ki Moshe. No one will ever be like Moshe. It is the end of an era. There will be no era like this. Moshe is the end of the era of panim el panim, where God speaks face to face. The Torah devotes a lot of space to the ends of eras, and very little to the beginning. Well, in, at least in terms of death. So David, who's David? Is he Avram or is he Yaakov? David is Avram. David is important because he begins the Davidic dynasty. And therefore, if you look at Shmuel and you look at Malachim, Shmuel is the story of David the person. Malachim is the story of the Davidic dynasty. And therefore, how does it start? It doesn't start with David, nor does it start with Shlomo. It starts with the transition from David to Shlomo. It starts with David dying, Adoniyahu trying to claim that he will be the heir to David, and David setting the record straight. It starts specifically with the creation of a dynasty. And how does it end? What ends Milachim? It ends, if you skip to eight, with the destruction of the temple. Because in Shmuel, in Shmuel, God had promised David, you will have a dynasty forever. And do you know why you'll have a dynasty forever? Because what hangs on David having a dynasty? The Beit HaMikdash. God tells David and Shmuel, I'm giving you a dynasty because you, I know, will carry my name. You, I know, will represent me. How will you represent me? The Beit HaMikdash. And what does Hashem say to David when David asks him, can I build the Beit HaMikdash? So everyone says, no, it's not true. He says, yes. He says, yes. Because be careful. What does David say? When Natan comes and tells him, you won't be, build the Beit HaMikdash, your son will. Does he say, oh shucks, I wanted to build the Beit HaMikdash. What does he do? He bursts into song. And in Devrei Yamim, you get chapters of his song to God, praising God. Because God didn't say no. He said, David, you aren't yourself. You're the father of a dynasty. You are merely a king. Because you don't have peace yet. You don't have an empire. But your son will have peace. Your son will solidify the dynasty. The Beit HaMikdash is the symbol of your divine rulership. And therefore, I can't give it to you until you transcend you. Until you are a dynasty. Until you are the Davidic monarchy. Not David the king, but the Davidic monarchy. Your son will represent you. Look at seven. If you don't believe me, look at seven. Seven. We find out that Shlomo 
for all his wisdom, sins. And God rejects him as king. And God decides that the monarchy will have to be split in two. But Shlomo himself remains king peacefully till the end of his days. And in 7, Malachim tells you why. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And he commanded him to not stray. He commanded him at this matter to not follow other gods. He did not obey what the Lord had commanded. So God said to Solomon, because you were guilty of this, you have not kept my covenant and the laws which I enjoined upon you, I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But I can't take it from you because of David, your father. But I can't tear it away from you fully. I'll leave you a shevet, which turns into two plus. Shvatim, I'll give it to your son, to Rechavam, for David, my servant, and for Yerushalayim. Now, what is this speech to Shlomo? If Shlomo sinned, why can't he lose the monarchy? Hashem tells him. Because you are not yourself. You are the embodiment of your father. You are the person who managed to make King David into the father of a dynasty. I can't take away your empire. And he tells him a second thing. I would love to take away the monarchy from you, but I can't. Again, because you are not you. You are the descendant of David. And then he tells him, Uleman Yerushalayim, Asher Bacharti. And because of Yerushalayim, because Milachim tells you the story that Shmuel, Shmuel opened. God promised David, I need you. I need you to form a dynasty which represents me in this world. What does it mean to represent me in this world? You will build the Beit HaMikdash. You will be, build a temple where the world will come to pray. The world will come to know what it means to serve God. But to impress the world, you need power. You need glory. You need splendor. So I'm going to give you a capital city, Yerushalayim. I'm going to give you a Beit HaMikdash. And as long as there is a Beit HaMikdash, as long as there's a temple, and there, as long as there is a Jerusalem, there will be a Davidic king. I can never take it away from you. Because a Beit HaMikdash without a king behind it, without a kingdom behind it, without a representative of God, won't work. So the book starts with the transition from David to Shlomo to tell you that David's life is about his dynasty, about his legacy and not himself. And it ends, I gave it to you in eight, with the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Because once the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed, David's story comes to a pause. Not an end, but a pause. Because if there is no Yerushalayim with a Beit HaMikdash, there's no Jerusalem with a temple, there's no need for a Davidic kingdom. But, and here's the caveat, Shlomo, for all his flaws, does represent what will one day be, because Shlomo manages to have peace. You look at 9, that all the days of Solomon, Judah, and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, dwelt in safety, everyone under his own vine and under his fig tree. And in Pasuk Yudal, and men of all people came to hear Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And number 10, the queen of Sheba, comes to Shlomo and she said, she said to the king, the report I heard in my own land about you and your wisdom was true. But I did not believe the reports until I came and saw with my own eyes that not even half that had been told to me, your wealth and your wisdom and wealth surpassed the reports that I heard. How fortunate are your men, how fortunate are these, your courtiers, who are always in attendance on you and can hear your wisdom. Praise be the Lord your God, who delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. It's because of the Lord's everlasting love for Israel that he made you king to his minister justice and righteousness. 
Shlomo does manage to succeed in setting the paradigm of what Shlomo, what David could have been. He creates a Beit HaMikdash, he creates a national center where the world comes to be inspired, not just of wisdom, but of godliness. The Queen of Sheba comes and says, I see that you represent God. And therefore he does, for all his flaws, manage to embody what the Davidic dynasty is supposed to look like. It comes to a crashing end 400 years later with the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. But, it'll be rebuilt. Because Shlomo becomes the model for who? Right, normally, I don't like finishing a shear this way, right? But if it asks for it, right? <laughs> right? Until Mashiach comes. Look at number 11. When Yeshayahu describes the Messiah, he says, Hain and Sedek, Yimloch Melech, Ulusarim Lishbat, Yashru, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and ministers shall govern with justice. Hine Yamim Baim Numadonai Bakimotil, David, Semech, Sadik, Umalach, Melech, Liskil, Vasa, Mishpat, Staka, Baaretz, Piamav, Tibasha, Yuda, Israel, Shkon, Lavetach, Vizeshmo, Asher, Yikru, Adonai, Sidkenu. I see a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up the true branch of David's line. He shall reign as king and shall prosper, and he shall do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah shall be delivered, and Israel shall dwell secure. And this is the name by which he shall be called, the Lord is our vindicator. Mashiach is what Shlomo was for a time and then failed to continue to be. A king who brings peace, a king who represents justice, a king who represents God in this world. Shlomo fails, so his kingdom has to end 400 years later. But the promise to David was eternal, and therefore Yeshayahu promises us that there will one day be an heir to the Davidic dynasty who will be a successful version of Shlomo. So what is Sefer Melachim in a nutshell in the last 30 seconds? It starts in the, what seems mid-story. Because it's here to remind us, it's not about the personalities, it's not about King David, it's not about King Solomon. Milachim is the story of the monarchy of Israel. To remind us that David transcended himself. His story is not his own. His story is that he managed to create a dynasty which represented his name. To have a son who for a time was Mashiach, was Messiah on earth, who brought peace who built a Beit HaMikdash, who judged with wisdom and justice, who brought all of humanity to Jerusalem to see what it means to represent God's world, God's word in this world. It had to end, and therefore Melachim ends with the destruction of Beit HaMikdash, at which point there is no need for a Davidic king, because the monarchy of David is necessary when there is a Jerusalem in its splendor with a temple. But Yeshayahu reminds us that this is only chapter one in that story. It may have ended with the destruction of Beit HaMikdash, but Shlomo in the years when he was successful represented what would one day be that dream of David, of creating a dynasty which represented God in Jerusalem. And Malachim therefore tells you of, as I called it, the rise and fall of the, of the Jewish dynasty. How it starts with Shlomo, what it could have been if it had been successful, what it was for a time, how it came crashing down because of the failures of the king. But the later Svarim remind us that it still acts as a model to remind us of what one day be. And as I said, this is the only time I end to share this way, when quickly with the becoming of Mashiach, who in the end of the day is modeled after Shlomo in his successful years. And we move to the next book. Yeah.